In my last webcast, I explained the great storm that is here and coming upon the world, and we promised we would start getting into the details of events that are unfolding right now in the world and that are coming. Well, before we go any further, I want to invite my co-host from the Palatial Studios in Albany, New York. Please welcome to the webcast, Professor Daniel O'Connor. Good to be here as always, Mark. Thanks. It's, um, it's true. We've been getting a lot of letters. I have, I'm sure you have as well, about people asking for more about what's coming. We've got this timeline up and countdown to the kingdom. We've hopefully convinced you in our first webcast that it is uh, not ridiculous to consider and to believe that we are in the end times. So now that we realize we're in them, let's take a look at what heaven has said, what scripture says, and what the signs of the times are indicating about these seals that are about to open up. That's right. And for those of you who don't didn't see my previous webcast, uh, I'll just summarize it this way. is that um, as I sat down one day to read Revelation chapter 6, uh, the, I remember the Lord just speaking in my heart, saying, this is the great storm like a hurricane that is coming upon the world. You'll want to see that webcast explaining the great storm. That'll make more sense to you, the the context. But the timeline that Daniel's referring to is this, from our um, website, countdowntothekingdom.com. And you can see there, we have a graphic of this great storm, like a hurricane, that, um, and we've laid on it all the different events that are coming according to the scriptures, according to the early church fathers, according to the popes, and also Daniel in tune with private revelation. And all of this has formed a prophetic consensus of a great storm that is now here and unfolding in the world. And that's what we're going to talk about, starting with the seven seals in the book of Revelation in chapter 6. And maybe, Daniel, before we do that, I've got sitting in front of me the book of Revelation, and Mm. I think we need to read this scripture. I think we do. Yeah, I just saw this yesterday, and it jumped off the page. I've maybe only read it once before in my life. I don't know why I haven't read this. But this is in chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written therein, for the time is near. Wow. Because right now, Daniel, it seems to me, well, we know, we believe that we are living already in the first seal of the book of Revelation, and on our website, that is called the time of mercy. And so that's what we want to talk about. So Daniel, why don't we just start right now, jump right in and go right to scripture, the book of Revelation. Blessed are you who are going to hear this. And blessed is Daniel for reading it. We're going to read to you now. (laughs) Blessed are all of us for this, for taking this seriously, which haven't, you know, it doesn't say there, blessed are those who write this all off and pretend that the end times can't possibly be their generation. No. So we're going to take this seriously. So we're skipping five chapters ahead now. That was that was right in the first paragraph of Revelation. This this reminder that you are blessed to to read and he, uh, to read this. So now let's take a look at the beginning of the sixth chapter. Then I watched while the Lamb broke open the first of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures cry out in a voice like thunder, "Come forward!" I looked, and there was a white horse, and its rider had a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode forth victorious to further his victories. All right, so what Daniel is reading right now, you'll see in the top left-hand corner of your screen, is the first seal. And we have labeled it the time of mercy, and we're going to explain to you right now why. Because... That scripture, many people in, you know, people who have done biblical exegesis, who've talked about these things, who've looked at them, they they look at the four writers of the apocalypse as all of them as writers of doom and gloom. But we want to present to you a different viewpoint today of this first rider, the rider on the white horse. But, you know, it's not our viewpoint. What we want to share with you right now is the viewpoint of a pope. And so what we're going to do is just go to the website, and you can do this as well. You don't have to do it now, but you can click on each of these tabs that were, you know, the first seal, for instance. Click on it, and you'll have these descriptions that we're talking about in the show. So you, this is your reference. And we want to just turn to the scripture now that, the, that Daniel just read. And here's the interpretation of Pius the Twelfth. 
He says this rider on the white horse is Jesus Christ. The inspired evangelist, St. John, not only saw the devastation brought about by sin, war, hunger, and death, that is, the coming seals, he also saw, in the first place, the victory of Christ. And Daniel, I, I love that because really what the Pope is saying, he's giving us a vision that this great hurricane that is now beginning, this great storm beginning to unfold in the world, is led by Jesus, that Jesus is the one who is leading this in order to maximize the the most amount of victories, that is victories, souls. That's what this is all about. Those are the victories that matter. This is about the salvation of souls. This isn't about keeping you know the, the present order nicely and neatly and keeping the status quo. Jesus wants us to be with him forever in heaven, and he'll do whatever it takes to most effectively achieve that end, whatever it takes. And if chastisements are the only possible way if he's tried everything else first, then that's what he's going to have to do. If if we force his hand, he wanted to do it an easier way. He wanted to do it by way of love. But so far, mankind has by and large yeah. rejected those invitations. You know, and, and that, that that's so important for you, for us to understand this, <clears throat> those who are watching, is to understand God is love. So his very nature is to want the best for us. And what is a, a unfolding right now and about to unfold in the world, you know, the Lord doesn't want to go this way. And Daniel, right before the show, we were talking about some words Jesus spoke to Louisa, servant of God, Louisa Picaretta. And mm. maybe right now would be a good time to read what Jesus has to say about how he wants yeah. to triumph in the world. And there is a triumph coming of the church and of Christ in the world. And if the Lord had his way, as you're about to hear, it would have been through just mercy and love. Mm. But he has a plan B. And let's see what he says about that. So this is to the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, on November 16th, 1926, from her diary. Jesus tells her, the chastisements that have occurred are nothing other than the preludes of those that will come. How many more cities will be destroyed? My justice can bear no more. My will wants to triumph. It would want to triumph by means of love in order to establish its kingdom. But man does not want to come to meet this love. Therefore, it is necessary to use justice. Yeah, I mean, there we are hearing the Lord telling us his will is to, is like a father, would be to bring us into the fullness of the plan of salvation through mercy and love. But it is we, as I explained in the previous webcast, explaining the great storm, this is a man-made storm in the beginning. We are reaping what we have sown. We are reaping, we have sown the whirlwind, and now we are Reap the reaping world. the whirlwind. And this is why we say in our tab that we are now living in a time of mercy. And there's a reason that we're saying this. And that's because in 1917, Our Lady appeared to three children at Fatima. And she, um, she, she warned them. She said, this time you are now. I mean, it was grave. I mean, Our Lady was appearing in other apparitions beforehand. But now it seemed that we had reached a pivotal point. And yep. she said, unless you consecrate, the church consecrates Russia to her Immaculate Heart, and the world repents. And I'm just saying this in a nutshell. Unless this happens, she said, Russia will spread her errors throughout the entire world. And why this is really interesting, Daniel, that she said that was because the communist revolution hadn't come yet. Right. So no one knew what she was talking about. What does she mean Russia will spread her errors throughout the world? The errors she was talking about was the errors of communism, Marxism, socialism, coming together to, to into the communist movement that would then grip Russia one month later after that apparition. So what Our Lady was saying, Daniel, is that if we did not repent, if we did not consecrate Russia to her, give it to her, that this revolution in Russia would then spread throughout the entire world in a global revolution. And that is exactly what is happening right now. As I said in my last webcast, this great storm now spreading throughout the world is this global revolution. And the reason is because we didn't listen. We didn't heed the call of Our Lady at Fatima. And one of the things that happened at Fatima, Daniel, was a warning, a vision that the kids have. And maybe you could share that with yeah. what those seers saw. 
Yeah, so we are we are uh, claiming that the time of mercy really began then, and here's why. As you may recall, if you've read about Fatima, the angel appeared with a flaming sword ready to chastise the world. What happened then? Did the world get chastised in that manner? No. The flaming sword did not touch the world, even though chastisements of some degrees, of course, did follow. But the flaming sword did not touch the world because it was stopped by rays of light coming from Our Lady. So the angel, this is not a demon, this is an angel, this is an executor of God's will. So in a sense, God's will was really that the chastisements start at that point, Mm -hmm. but they didn't. And what does that mean? That means that there was an even deeper dimension, even deeper dimension to his will there, which was that something else begin, the time of mercy, which began then and which we're now nearing the very end of. That's right. And so with the angel, with that chastisement being stopped, Daniel, we entered into a time of mercy. And if we go back to our timeline, we want you to hear what Jesus says. So we've entered into a time of mercy. You heard about this first seal, the rider on the white horse wearing a crown. Now listen to what, about 15 some years later, what St. Faustina says. She said, that I saw the Lord Jesus like a king in great majesty, so like a king wearing a crown, looking down upon the earth with great severity. That's how severe this point in history has become. But because of his mother's intercession, he prolonged the time of mercy. You know, I just got to stop right there, Dan, because I'm just thinking, what if he hadn't? We may not be here right now. Right. 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 We may not be here. But Jesus then said, let the greatest sinners place their trust in my mercy right before i come as a just judge i first open wide the door of my mercy the door of my mercy he who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice and if you look at our graphic on our website you'll see that in right in the center there the door of mercy the labor pains that we are now passing through this is going to be god's way of as that first seal says that rider on the white horse riding on to new victories shooting his arrows of love and mercy into the hearts of as many people as he can even using the suffering that man is bringing upon himself in this time of mercy and this is enormous. I mean, look, this this is not, the, by saying this is a time of mercy, we're not making just a general reference to the age of the church. Sure, in a sense, the entire age of the church is, a, is an age of great mercy. We're talking, however, not about that in general right now, but about very specifically the, the age, the era in which we're in right now. Um, this door of mercy, uh, look at the holy year of mercy, look at the papal bull by which Pope Francis instituted it. He specifically referred to doors of mercy being opened. And unlike any holy year in the history of the church, a door of mercy was opened in every diocese in the world. Yeah. And I mean, it is a it is almost a word for word reflection of St. Faustina's diary. Yeah. St. Francis, cl- uh, sorry, Pope Francis clearly had that in mind when he was instituting this holy year. Because guess what? A couple of years earlier in 2014, he said, I quote, We are here to hear the voice of the Spirit speaking to the whole church of our time, which is a time of mercy. I am sure of this, he said. It is not only Lent. He gave these, uh, these remarks during Lent. We are living in a time of mercy and have been for 30 years or more up to today. So, you know, as as you've heard from us already, Mark and I are strongly of the opinion that it was more than 30 years. But still, Pope Francis is saying we are in a very specific time of mercy now. He, he knew that. And then he goes on to refer to blessed. At that point, he was only blessed. John Paul II, realizing the same thing, tying that into St. Faustina and Pope Francis tying it into St. Faustina. And then this holy year of mercy, specifically reflecting the language in the Divine Mercy Diary about the door of mercy first opening up and then the door of justice. We are on the very cusp of that time being over. 
Oh, yeah. Well said, Daniel. And I'll tell you, folks, this is why. There's, there's more to this than just the fact that it's, it's mankind falling into sin. But the reason we have reached such a huge, um, you know, of biblical proportions is that the popes were warning. They were saying to us that there is coming a global revolution. What Our Lady said at Fatima, the popes were already beginning to warn. And that's why when you, you go to our timeline and you see this great storm, it's also representative of this global revolution. And the popes were warning that this was coming. And we just want to take a moment right now to go to those words of what the popes were saying in the late uh, 1800s. So this is in the 19th century. And we turn right now to Pope, uh, this is Pope Pius IX. And he said, you are indeed aware, he said, that the goal of this most iniquitous plot is to drive people to overthrow the entire order of human affairs and to draw them over to the wicked theories of this socialism and communism. So right there, we're hearing, before Our Lady announced the errors of Russia, you have the Pope's warning, warning us that there is a plot. Now, uh, Daniel, and I think this drives us crazy because we hear people so often say, oh, this is conspiracy theory. These secret societies, the Freemasons and the Illuminati. I mean, come on, people, right? Yeah, and look, the, the magisterium does not condemn non-existent things. The magisterium, however, has repeatedly condemned these secret societies, especially Freemasonry, and it has not done so in vain. It is for good reason, because they are behind so much evil, and their plans are still very much in the works. And, and and who are they today? We you know these go by the names of the philan global philanthropists, international bankers, um, the political term being used today is the deep state. Whatever you want to call it, um, we're referring to precisely what the Pope said: these secret societies who are orchestrating right now this great storm, this global revolution. And this is why it is so serious. And so we're going to just go right back to the popes again and explain uh, what the concern was of the popes. And it was, in this case, it was Pope Leo XIII who explained the whole goal of what these guys were after. And he said, and I'm just going to go jump into the middle, he talks about the Freemasons right there. You can see it in the quote. And he says they're no longer making any secret of their purposes. They're now boldly rising up against God himself. And that which is their ultimate purpose forces itself into view, namely the utter overthrow of that whole religious and political order of the world which the Christian teaching has produced. And the substitution of a new state of things in accordance with their ideas of which the foundations and laws shall be drawn from mere naturalism. That is, not from God, not from the Catholic Church, but from their idea of creating a utopia here on earth. And this is why, Daniel, we have come to the point now where this plot is beginning to work. If you have any doubts about it, turn on the news and look at what's happening in the streets. The word revolution is openly being used. And not only that, we are seeing young people carrying signs, death to capitalism, you know, Marxism, up with Marxism, up with socialism. Daniel, this was warned about 100 and, over 140 years ago, and right. we're watching it now in real time. Oh, goodness. And we are, the chickens are coming home to roost. And... As I said before, we probably don't even have to convince you of this because you can probably walk out your door and see the fruits of it. Boarded up windows, people afraid of each other, vitriol everywhere, impossibility of the basic tenets of, of just friendliness that we used to take for granted are just starting to disappear. Society is falling apart, and um, this is indeed part of a plan. Mark said, talked about their desire to build this utopia on earth. And it's ironic because you might think that almost sounds like the era of peace, but it's a diabolical twisting of it, that the devil always apes the things of God. Of course, we're looking forward to the era of peace after these events, after these chastisements from God. We're not going to build it ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's this progressive evolutionism, liberation, theology, utopianism type heresy. No, we are praying for the coming of the kingdom of God, which he is going to institute. But we'll have to save, you know, we'll have to save the details of that for a future right. webcast. But if, if you don't mind me sharing a quick quote here, because I think some of our 
viewers might be struggling with this idea that the time of mercy really started that long ago, back in the early 1900s. They might be thinking, well, goodness, wasn't everything great back then? I mean, didn't everybody go to the Latin mass? <laughs> Look, God, don't look to the 1920s to the 1950s as if they were some glory days, like some sort of Garden of Eden. They, they were not. In 1903, Pope St. Pius X, in an encyclical, E Supremi, in which he gave, it was his most important encyclical, he said, we, the royal we, he's referring to himself here, we were terrified beyond all else by the disastrous state of human society today. For who can fail to see that society is, at the present time, more than at any past age? suffering from a terrible and deep-rooted malady which, developing every day and eating into its inmost being, is dragging it to destruction. You understand, venerable brethren, what this disease is, apostasy from God. He's saying in 1903 that that was worse than ever, be ever before in history, that the world had sunk to lower depths than ever before, worse than before the flood, worse than before ancient pagan barbarism, worse than at the time of the Protestant Revolution, worse than at the time of the mm -hmm. Black Death. The, the chastisement should have started then. That's right. He says in that same encyclical, the Antichrist is probably already alive, but they were delayed. And, and Daniel, we're reaching the end of our extensions. Sorry, that, you know, that reminds no. me again of that scripture I read in the previous webcast where the Bible talks about this great storm that is like a hurricane. And I just want to turn to that for a moment because it's exactly what you're talking about. This word apostasy was used by St. Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he talked about this apostasy, which is the mystery of lawlessness at work. And if we go again to Wisdom chapter 5, verse 23, it says, A mighty wind will rise against them, and like a tempest, it will winnow them away. That will sift us lawlessness, there's that word, will lay waste the whole earth, and evil doing will overturn the thrones of rulers. There you have the scripture, right there from the Book of Wisdom, telling us that the whole goal of this iniquitous plot of these secret societies is to overturn the thrones of rulers, political rulers, and church rulers, and from this create a whole new world order. And we are watching it in real time as lawlessness oh, yeah. is spreading throughout the world. And I'm not talking about rioting and looting in the streets. That's anarchy. What we're talking about, again, is when judges put on robes, go into their courtrooms, and overturn the natural moral law. That Just today. Is Just today That's in right. America. This That's very right. day. Uh, the, so if we, ca if we can't even understand that male and female, he created them, there's not much lower than we could sink. Right. There really isn't. That's right. We've we've lost our weight, and hence the reason we've come to this great storm that we are in. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, I'm um, I'm thinking right now again of that scripture quote. Uh, I'm not sure if you had something else you wanted to add before we move on in this webcast. So many things. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll have to save them for future webcasts. I think. Well, I'm just maybe what we could do is wrap up with the quote from uh, Psalm twenty, Psalm chapter seven, verse thirteen, mm -hmm. and this is again is on our website. It's under that seal, the tab for the first seal, and this is what it says about the rider on the white horse. Really, I think it says, "If one does not repent, God sharpens his sword, strings and readies the bow." prepares his deadly shaft, and makes arrows blazing thunderbolts. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. The Lord would not allow this storm to come forward unless we were pushing it. We were the ones bringing it about, and that is the case. Because as it says, if we do not repent, it's the Lord has to ready the bow. The, the arrows of love and mercy, they're not working. They're not turning our hearts back to God. We are now, we've pushed God out of society. We've pushed him out of our legislatures. We've pushed him out of the courtroom. We've pushed him out of our schools. And we have now brought this great storm upon ourselves. And so it's time for us to get ready, Daniel, for the fun, right. the, the coming seals yeah. that are there. Yeah, they're not where, and look, by and large, as far as the world is concerned, they're not working, but... There's still a little time left mm -hmm. for them to work, hopefully, for as many souls as possible. And God knows the number, but you are a part of that. 
you are a part of proclaiming the divine mercy while there's still time left in the time of mercy. Do I have time for a few quick Absolutely. words on why I think this time of mercy while we're out of extensions? So that, you know, we talked about this time of mercy starting back in Fatima in, in uh, over a hundred years ago. But clearly, we've had a number of extensions of this time of mercy so far. It probably should have ended mm. uh, back in World War II. That probably should have been the harbinger of the major chastisements, right. but it wasn't. It probably should have ended. Uh, Pope Francis probably had 1984 in mind when he said in 2014, you know, it, we've been in the time of mercy for 30 years or more. He probably had the Cold War in mind and the, the, the consecration that Pope St. John Paul II did, delaying things further. And, of course, we should pray for the consecration to be done again, naming Russia, yes, but clearly there were good fruits from the 1984 consecration also. But, you know, it probably should have ended in 2000 with the great jubilee of the, of the year 2000. And think about what Father Gobi was saying. It probably should have ended in 2017 with the centenary of Fatima and the end of the year of mercy, which so clearly uh, was eschatological in nature. And the bottom line of all this is we're out of extensions. We're, we're out. Like, you know, God is a lot more merciful than I am. As a, you know, as a teacher, I get asked for extensions a lot. <laughs> and I go by the old German saying, once is, once is never, twice is always. So, you know, if, if you're going to ask me for an extension again, forget about it. You're clearly right. up to something. But God's a lot more merciful than, than I am. He's given us a bunch of extensions already. But one thing is becoming abundantly clear is that we're out of them. You can look at any prophecy to any authentic seer today. They're all saying the same thing. We yeah. uh, Look, we're just four humble people who, who are not at all powerful or anything putting together Countdown of the Kingdom. We can't orchestrate a prophetic consensus across the whole world. Yeah. It is all saying the same thing. It's saying we're up. No prophecies yeah. anymore are saying there's a number of events coming, but it'll be a while. The, in, in earlier prophecies, you could find plenty of examples of that. And if I had more time, I'd quote them right now. Maybe in a future webcast, I will. Prophecies that said, look, this will happen, but it's going to be a while. All these other things have to happen first. This is not going to be soon. Nobody is saying that anymore. We are now at the very cusp of the close of the time of mercy. So we need to hold nothing back in proclaiming the divine mercy Amen. while there's still time. That's right. And, you know, folks, I think that we need to see that where we are right now, we can, all, we can see now the division happening between people. And I'm not talking about left and right in politics, even though politics have never been so polarized, but between right and wrong. You know, evil has become good. Good has become evil. And we want to encourage you right now, as Daniel just said, to proclaim the divine mercy, that is, proclaim the gospel to people, not to be afraid. Love the truth. Defend the truth. We're hearing this over and over again from seers around the world. Love and defend the truth and speak the truth. Tell your testimony to people. Share with them the good news of what Jesus has done in your heart. Our testimony is powerful, as it says in Revelation chapter 12, that they, they, the Christians, overcame the accuser of the brethren, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Our testimonies are powerful. They contain the word of God because it's, in a sense, it's the unwritten pages of the gospel that are being written in our lives. That's the second, first thing. Second thing, the word of God itself, the scriptures. They're not a history book. They're not a textbook. They're the living Word of God. So what we're saying is have confidence in the Word of God in this time. And I want to say, just to add to this, stop thinking right now about convincing souls, about winning arguments, and planting seeds of love. And this is really important, what I'm saying, Daniel, because people right now, um, they're not open to the truth. And we can see more and more people. Some are, some aren't. But a lot of people now are turning away from the church because this revolution, this great revolution that we're talking about is aimed at the church. And I'm hearing rhetoric in the streets. We're going to talk about this in future webcasts. The kind of rhetoric we're seeing is now slowly beginning to turn against the church. You're going to see revolution in the streets and the burning of buildings. that will be more than just a restaurant. It will be our churches. I mean, God help us for the times that are coming. But here's the thing. You can see in the center of your screen, there is the eye of the storm coming. The seeds you plant now, by the power of the word of your testimony and the word of God, those seeds, people are going to remember the love you showed them. 
It's so important right now that we begin to show love, that we don't get into the rhetoric that is so divisive, and that we show people who the face of love is. Because when it comes down to it, brother, people are going to turn to the ones who stood on the truth who defended the truth, and they're going to come to them after the eye of the storm. And we're going to explain what that is in a future webcast. They're going to come to you and say, please help me. I don't know what happened to me just now, but please help me. Yeah. And in case you missed that, Mark, he said, stop thinking about winning arguments. Start thinking about sowing the seeds of love. Because don't worry about seeing the growth you can see that on judgment day do you, you you do believe that there will be a judgment day right remember that there will be one you will be able to see all the fruits of your labors mm-hmm. then don't worry about seeing the fruits of them now just do your job as zealously as possible so many catholics today are getting caught up in these endless debates about all the minutia of what's going on in the church and that is not where god wants you right now uh Yes, proclaim the truth. Yes, never compromise with the faith. Open up your catechism, submit to it, period, end of discussion. If you're willing to do that, you're ready for the battle. Um, there was a priest who, 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 and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, who received this, this word, this prophetic word, that the debates that are now transpiring about all of these details, there won't be time to finish them. Hmm. So let's, not, <laughs> let's wow. not waste so much time with them anymore. Let's proclaim the divine mercy while we still have time left in the time of mercy. So, you know, if, if I can be so bold as to give a few specific suggestions on that, I would love to. You see on your screen now the divine mercy image. And Jesus. And, and I'm just going to jump in a really quick. Do. Sorry, Daniel. No, just, do, please, to re- do. just to remind everyone who's listening what the mission of the church is. Pope Paul VI said the church exists to evangelize. It doesn't matter whether we're in a storm or not, it doesn't matter whether we're in the apocalypse or not. Until the end of time, our mission is to make known the gospel. The church exists to evangelize. I just wanted to remind us that that's where we need to keep our eyes fixed. Right. It is not about staying safe. It is not about (laughs) staying comfortable. Amen. It is not about keeping everything as beautiful as it always has been. And it's we need to get out there and uh, get a little, not be afraid of getting our hands dirty. Get this message of mercy out there. Oh my goodness, there are so many souls perishing for lack of other souls willing to invite them into the divine mercy. The number, my people perish for lack of knowledge. (laughs) And and lack of just, Mm -hmm. the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. That's not, that's referring to vocations, yes, but not just that. It's also referring to just how few faithful souls there are willing to bring this message out to those who have not yet heard it adequately proclaimed. And sure, everybody knows what Christianity is. That doesn't mean they've heard it adequately proclaimed. And you can get to the heart of the gospel with the divine mercies, especially that divine mercy image that was just on your screen. Don't let anybody on the face of the planet not see that. Jesus promised St. Faustina that whoever mm-hmm. venerates this image shall not perish. Yeah. In, other way, in, in other words, whoever venerates this image won't go to hell. It's hard to imagine... Uh, a more inspiring promise than that. We need to make sure that everybody has a chance to venerate this image. Get it out there. Um, just today, or maybe it was yesterday, my my other Divine Mercy image fell off the back of my car, which happens every couple of years. So I just got a new one, and I didn't have time to do my usual routine of doing it well. So I just took packing tape, and I stuck it on the back of my car, clear packing tape. Um, the, the salvation of souls, it really is worth some tape residue getting, <laughs> getting stuck on your bumper. Right. <laughs> and the salvation of souls is worth that. Newsflash. Um, get the divine mercy image in your house, of course, so your family can venerate it every day. Get it outside of your house so people driving by can see it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a big, huge one at the base of my driveway, and I can't tell you how many random people walking and driving by have effusively thanked me for that. Even people I could tell were far from God to begin with. And at the bottom of the image that you see on your screen right now, there's five words that Jesus asked to be put at the bottom of the painting of this image. And those five words are, Jesus, I trust in you. And you know, in the the passage that St. Peter quotes from Joel, which speaks of the end times, at the end, he describes all these apocalyptic things. And at the end of it, it says, but all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what? When this great storm hits in its full force, and it's not that far off, folks, we are we are beginning to feel the first winds. 
all our catechisms, our papal documents, our canon laws, all our stacks of theological know-how and so on, all of it's going to be reduced down to five words. Jesus, I trust in you. And those who call on those words, Jesus will extend his mercy to them. He's made it simple for us in these times. Five words. Jesus, I trust in you. And you can even begin to pray those today. We, you know, we, we don't know who's watching this right now. But we want you to know that Christ loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. And it doesn't matter how dark your sin is. How, you know, Jesus said to St. Faustina, even should your sins be like scarlet, you know, the greatest sinner has the recourse to my mercy. The greatest sinner is the one that Jesus is seeking out today, not the saints. He's already got them, but he's looking for those of us who have fallen and fallen far right now. This is the mm. time of mercy. The greater the sinner, the greater the right to my mercy. Amen. Boy, is that paradoxical, but Jesus said it, so I'm going to go ahead and believe it, that you have nothing. Look, the events that are coming, quite fearsome, aren't they? But there's one thing you never have to be afraid of, and that's Jesus. You never have to be afraid of approaching him. I don't care how far away you are from him now. Approach him, those five words. What's coming might make you forget everything else. But if you can remember those five words, Jesus, I trust in you. And let me submit to you, please, Add a couple more prayers to the end of that. If you can remember some more. Jesus, I trust in you. Mm -hmm. Thy will be done. I give you my will. Please give me yours in return. We'll get more into those things in a future webcast. But Jesus is asking us to accept his mercy and then give, us, give him our own will so that he can give us his will. And then we really become ready for what's coming. More on that in a future webcast. But right now, you know, we're, we're going to end very shortly here. But just we want you to remember that the time of mercy is so close to ending. And we don't have dates. Not, neither Mark nor I have dates to give you. Well, you know, what well, we might quote seers sometimes who themselves have dates. We don't put them forward with our own authority or anything. Not that, not that we have any authority. We're, we're, not, we're just two guys talking about these things. But... Looking at the prophetic consensus, it's worth acknowledging that we might be so close to the end of mercy that who knows, we might only have weeks left. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but we might. We might be that yeah. close. So, you know, whatever excuse you've been using up to now to not proclaim the divine mercy, forget about it. You got to do this. Yeah. The salvation of souls rests upon it. That divine mercy image, praying the divine mercy chaplet encouraging souls to trust in the divine mercy. You might say, oh, I don't have a divine mercy image. Well, you, you have a computer or something digital because you're watching this. So find a way to print it out. If you don't have a printer, go to Staples or, or, or Kinko's or something like that and print That's it out. Right. Or you can order one. My, my good friend, Father Chris Alar, he, he, he recently made a video about signing the doorposts, just like with in the Old Testament, signing the doorposts of the blood of the Lamb. Sign your doorposts with the divine mercy now. And I guess one thing we want to we want to keep reminding everyone who's watching is that the whole end. The, what is the purpose of this great storm? Well, you can see on our graphic that it ends. The ultimate goal, of course, is the final coming or the second coming of Jesus in the flesh at the end of time. But before that, and we're going to get to that in another webcast, is we have to have yet the fulfillment of the Our Father when the words we pray will come true. Thy kingdom come, thy will, thy be, will done be done on, on earth, earth as, as it is, is in heaven. heaven. That's right. That's going to happen. It's going to happen. But for it's now, brothers and sisters, we are living in the time of the first seal. This is the time of mercy. And in our next webcast, we're going to get to the second seal now because all the signs are there that we are on the threshold. We can hear the war drums that are beating and about to shatter peace in the world. So from Daniel and I, both, we are praying for you. Know that we are always praying for you. Please pray for us and know that we love you and we're doing this for you. Pray for us that God will continue to give us the wisdom to be able to explain these things in these difficult times. And remember five words. Jesus, I, Jesus, trust, in I trust in you. God bless you. God bless.